Hello everyone. Please take a deep breath. Because to begin tonight's story, we're going to make an accelerated trip from the creation of the Earth to the period we will explore tonight, the Pleistocene, also known as the Ice Age. This journey begins four and a half billion years ago when, in our corner of the galaxy, a planet, like billions of other planets, began to form around a young star. At the beginning, really just a ball of liquid metal and rock that was intensely bombarded by asteroids of all sizes. Its surface was made of molten rock, rivers of lava, volcanoes. Its geography changed fast, as the planet was acquiring an internal structure and changing appearance under heavy bombardment. Its atmosphere was made of toxic gases. It contained almost no trace of oxygen, and no conceivable life form could exist on such a hell. This was the Hadean, the first age, the first eon of Earth. But even though it lasted for 500 million years, it finally came to an end. Four billion years ago, the bombardment slowed down, a thicker and thicker crust solidified as the planet cooled down and this primordial hell became a bit quieter. A new eon began. The Archean. Continents had formed, looking very different and in other locations than they are today. And between them, there were oceans of liquid water. There was still almost no oxygen in the atmosphere, and the land was naked. No plant was to be found anywhere on the land, animals even less, and there were no witnesses to the still intense volcanism, to the earthquakes, to the rise of mountain chains as tectonic plates slowly moved and collided or fell under the seas. This eon lasted for an inconceivable one and a half billion years, three times longer than the Hadean. But something else happened during it. In shallow waters, near the continents, or where the ocean floor was close to the surface, life had appeared. Nothing spectacular yet, only mats of microorganisms forming colonies. But a new phenomenon appeared with them. These organisms could use sunlight energy to produce chemical reactions that made their life cycle possible. This phenomenon, photosynthesis, liberated more and more free oxygen. For hundreds of millions of years, the vast oceans of Earth absorbed this oxygen, and the atmosphere stayed oxygen-free. But at some point, the water became saturated, and oxygen began to escape to the atmosphere. After one and a half billion years, the Archean Eon was reaching its end and a new age was about to begin, an even longer one, that would last for two billion years. The name that men later gave to the Sian, which started with the appearance of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, is the Proterozoic, a word meaning earlier or former life. During this age, 
a new miracle happened. Life forms had been made of a single cell, but organisms with several cells multiplied. Maybe they had appeared sooner, during the Archean, but their numbers grew exponentially. They were still very small, but several times bigger than earlier organisms that they now coexisted with, and they kept changing the chemical composition of the oceans and the air. Oxygen was now freely escaping the oceans and accumulating in the atmosphere. Many things continued to happen at the surface of the planet during these two billion years. Continents kept drifting and the Earth changed appearance. The climate changed multiple times. And at some points, the Earth may have been entirely frozen, looking like a snowball traveling in space. There were still no land plants and animals. But in the seas, as the end of this eon neared, the first soft-bodied small animals had begun to colonize the oceans. We are now 540 million years into the past. We have already traveled almost 90% of the Earth's existence, and a new eon was about to begin. The Phanerozoic, our eon, the age of abundant animal and plant life on Earth. Abundant, but with ups and downs. Multiple times, life radiated and grew exponentially. The first species of animals able to survive out of the water started walking on continents. Different plants covered the land and formed forests that could prosper in a now oxygen-rich atmosphere. But also multiple times, after millions and millions of years, the development of life and the new species that had appeared were upset by catastrophic events. Intense volcanism, changes in climate patterns, collisions with asteroids. And when it happened, many species went extinct and life had big setbacks, from which it always recovered. These phases of expansion that ended abruptly are as many eras that are themselves cut into periods that saw more limited extinctions. We call these periods Cambrian, Ordovician, Carboniferous, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Twelve in total have been identified and named as segments within the Phanerozoic Eon. And they are themselves composed of shorter epochs because they still lasted dozens of millions of years, and various events or pattern changes were observed within these long periods. Finally, 2.6 million years ago, almost yesterday, at the scale of the 4.5 billion years we have quickly traveled, one of these periods, called Neogene, ended in glaciation, and a new one, called Quaternary, began. This is our period. The first epoch of the Quaternary, the Pleistocene, is also called the Ice Age, because it was characterized by various glaciations, various expansions and then withdrawals of ice sheets over the continents. But it was still an age of abundant life and of fast evolution of species, including of ours, 
and more broadly of the genus Homo that we belong to, that became arguably the most successful at colonizing Earth. This ice age, the Pleistocene, ended less than 12,000 years ago, in a new epoch of relative heating, the Holocene, the epoch we live in. But what we are going to explore tonight is what the planet was like during the Ice Age, who and what lived on it, or at least what we know or can suppose of it, what animals walked the earth and lived in the seas. So there will be mammoth, saber-toothed tigers, but also other lesser known species. I will tell you about the rise and diversification of the genus Homo, of archaic humans, and the evolution of our species. This is a field of investigation that keeps going through a lot of changes in our understanding of the past, with a lot of new discoveries and theories in the past few decades. So bear in mind that the state of the scientific consensus could and will probably keep changing. Most of what we are going to detail tonight deserves the conditional. It is no definitive truth, but rather theories that are informed and supported by paleontology, archaeology, geology, climate science and reasoning, but still theories. Before we dive into all this, take a little moment to focus on your breathing and get rid of the tension in your shoulders and your limbs. This talk can accompany you if you wish to fall asleep and there is no need to listen to it entirely in a single sitting. You can use the timestamps in the description and on your screen to navigate between the chapters or return later. The timestamps are also in the pinned comment under the video, together with links to audio streaming sites like Spotify or Apple Music if you'd like to listen there, and a link to my Patreon page. You won't be bothered before during or after this story by any ad break, and this is thanks to the support that many of you are kind enough to give me on Patreon. But becoming a patron also gives you the possibility to download all stories easily, to participate in surveys, to get updates or listen to everything as podcasts. So, if you feel inspired to join and contribute to keep this channel going, you are more than welcome. And now that we are all set, let's start walking the earth during the Ice Age. What did our planet look like two and a half million years ago? Maps of continents would have actually looked rather similar to today, over tens or hundreds of millions of years. The aspect of land masses can change dramatically, because continents have time to drift apart or collide, and can travel thousands of miles. But two or three million years is not that much on a geological scale, and so the continents were already almost where they are today. However, a closer look would reveal plenty of small differences. First, during the several glaciations that happened over cycles of tens of thousands of years, we will come back to this, the ice sheets near the poles, extended much farther than today. 
For example, in North America, all of Canada was sometimes under ice, and polar ice also covered the northern parts of the United States. Cities like Boston, New York, Chicago, Seattle would have sometimes been under ice. On the other side of the North Pole, much of Siberia and Western Russia were also in the same situation. At maximum extension, it is estimated that about 30% of the Earth's surface was covered in ice, hence the term Ice Age, even though it was only during peaks of glaciations. And even during these periods, tropical and equatorial regions had a much warmer climate. Glacial advance meant that huge volumes of water were tied up in continental ice sheets, and this made the sea level on other parts of the planet drop. It could be up to 300 feet or 100 meters lower than today. The implication of this was that many islands of today were connected by land with continents. Various straits did not exist, and overall there was more land surface. On several occasions, North America and Asia became connected by land around the Strait of Bering, allowing animals or humans to cross. Another major change that happened just as the Pleistocene began was the land connection between North and South America. The two continents became joined by the Isthmus of Panama. Prior to that, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans were connected in the middle. North and South America were separated by a sea. This new connection had dramatic consequences. South America had been a gigantic island for dozens of millions of years, developing its own terrestrial species that could have ancient connections with species of other continents, but had evolved separately for a very long time. So this new land bridge between North and South America produced an exchange of species that could now go to or exit South America. The connection also probably had a dramatic impact on the climate, because it cut a major passage between the two largest oceans of the planet, and this changed oceanic circulation with impacts on temperatures, winds, currents. Apart from continental glaciers, the impact of glaciations also maintained a cold climate near the edges of the glacial sheet. In North America, southward from the edge of ice, there was a zone of a few hundred miles of permafrost that is to say, ground that continually remains frozen, below zero degrees Celsius. In Eurasia, Siberia for the most part, the permafrost zone was even larger. These permafrost regions can be precious for scientists, because they can keep entire specimens of extinct species frozen for thousands of years, or even tens of thousands of years, provided the area does not warm up. This is how specimens of extinct species that were very well preserved, like mammoths, could be retrieved. Also south of the ice sheets, large lakes accumulated when the earth warmed up, because outlets were blocked. For example, this happened on a large scale in central North America with the creation of a disappeared lake called Lake Agassiz 
northwest of the Great Lakes, in the middle of Canada. This glacial lake, created by uh, glaciers melting, was larger than the UK or almost twice as large as Florida. It appeared at the very end of the Ice Age, and it thought to have lasted only a few thousand years, until it was drained and uh, evaporated, leaving only uh, smaller lakes. The geography of Canada, or Finland, with their abundance of lakes, still bears the traces of this period. But how many of these glaciations were there, and why? This is where the study of glaciers and polar caps provides interesting information, because the variations in the composition of the atmosphere, like the quantity of carbon dioxide or other gases, leaves traces in the various layers of accumulated ice. It suggests that significant advances of the ice sheets, glaciation periods, happened at intervals of approximately 40,000 to 100,000 years. In between the long glacial periods, there were shorter periods of 10 to 15,000 years, when the climate became closer to what we know today. For land and marine species, these phases that repeated cyclically had each time a huge impact on their habitat. It did not always lead to their extinction, but often to their migration away from the advancing continental glaciers and frozen seas, looking for warmer regions where they could feed themselves. But why these cycles of cooling and warming? It is believed they were due to the cyclicality of climatic factors at the Earth's surface. Climate, ocean currents, wind currents, temperature, and other movements obey to cycles. Cycles that are influenced by their interaction, by the composition of the atmosphere, the motion of the planet, or its obliquity its axial tilt, that is to say, small changes in the angle of the Earth's axis. There is also the intensity of solar radiation that varies over time. And eventually these multiple cycles come into harmony. They converge to provoke a dramatic shift in the climate. These cycles can exist for long periods of time, but they are not eternal. Their repetition with small variations introduce elements of instability that can change them eventually. For example, a pattern change was observed during the Ice Age, by the middle of it. Prior to the change, the periodicity of glaciations was about 40,000 years. But a transition happened that changed the periodicity to 100,000 years, but with a higher amplitude, more powerful coolings. These climate variations had an impact on all living beings, on plants too, and that included men, that emerged as an increasingly dominant and adaptable species during this period. So, what were these species? What was the fauna like? Some are famous, like mammoth, or the smelodon, the saber-toothed tiger, but these are just a few iconic animals among thousands and thousands of species, many of which still exist. Let's take a look at the animals we could have met on this earth. The Ice Age confirmed a phenomenon that had started millions of years earlier, the domination of mammals on land. This domination began long before 
paleontologists dated from the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago. You know that birds are classified as dinosaurs because they are on the same branch in the tree of evolution, the same clade as it is called. However different a T-Rex and a sparrow look like, they have a single common ancestor. This is why dinosaurs as a clade are not extinct, but all non-avian dinosaurs, dinosaurs excluding birds, large and small, many of them were small, did not make it past the mass extinction that happened at the end of the Cretaceous. The period that followed this extinction, the Paleogene, so once again life expand and branch out. But this time, with an explosion of mammals as the dominant land animals, dominant in the sense that they generally came out on top of the food chains, but also dominant in terms of numbers and presence all around the world in very different environments. As you know, mammals have this particularity to nurse, to feed their young with milk produced by mammary glands. There are other characteristics that are less visible include the fact that they have a neocortex, a region of the brain, and three middle ear bones, that is to say three tiny bones that serve to transmit sounds from the air to the inner ear. All mammals have these characteristics, even though they can take different shapes. The basic body has four extremities, and most mammals use the four for terrestrial locomotion. We only use two, our legs, as humans. But this is not always the case. These extremities can be adapted for life at sea. Think of dolphins or seals or whales, life in trees, life underground, or even if the air, if you think of bats. The diversity of sizes is also impressive. Mammals range from one or two inches, like the bumblebee bat, a very small bat, to almost a hundred feet for blue whales. And yet, all mammals are apparented, they have a single ancestor. The modern order of mammalians arose during the Paleogene and Neogene. Many species appeared and went extinct during that period. But the appearance of the first mammals is much older than that. They emerged from a group called Cenodonts approximately 260 million years ago. The first mammals are all extinct. They already had a diversity of sizes and positions in the food chain, but they tended to be small for dozens of millions of years, and they also tended to be prey rather than predators. Until non-avian dinosaurs disappeared, and liberated space, ecological niches for large mammals to replace them. Other factors that could explain the success of mammals include their relative intelligence. They can learn and adapt. There is also their reproductive strategy. They have few babies, but they take care of them and uh, transmit them survival skills, and also their adaptability to different environments. They regulate their internal temperature, which requires more food intake, but it also makes them able to survive under very different climates and endure big variations of temperature. So mammals, as a group, thrived since the Paleogene. And when the Ice Age began, the Pleistocene began, they had mostly reached their modern forms. 
apart from uh, a few extinct species of uh, megafauna of large mammals, the Ice Age fauna would have looked very familiar to us. There were apes, lions, wolves, tigers, bears, horses, elephants, all sorts of rodents, whales, dolphins, and all the coastal mammals that we know of. Other orders of animals were also very similar to what we know today, from birds to fish to insects. So let's take a look at extinct mammals, starting with probably the most iconic, mammoth. A mammoth is not a single species. There were various apparented species, forming a, a genus. In the classification of living beings, a genus is the rank above individual species. This genus, Mammothus, belongs to a broader family called Elephantidae, a family that includes elephants. So, mammoth and elephants were relatively close cousins. The degree of separation between them was not that big. And elephantidae are all large terrestrial animals with a snoot that has evolved into a trunk and teeth modified into much bigger tusks. Most known species of elephantidae went extinct thousands of years ago, and there are only two left nowadays, African elephants and Asian elephants. So, mammoths appeared around 5 million years ago. Like their cousins, they were herbivorous, and various species of mammoths populated a large part of the Earth, Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America. As far as we know, not Australia or South America, which were separated from other continents by large bodies of water. The oldest known representant of this genus of mammoths appeared in what is now southern and eastern Africa, a warm region at the time already. Descendants of the species moved north and continued to propagate in every direction, covering most of Eurasia. And around 1.5 to 1.3 million years ago, they crossed to North America. Mammoth could reach impressive sizes and weights. Exceptionally, large males could exceed 13 tons. But most of the time, they were about the size of modern elephants, not bigger. They probably tended to have more hair than elephants. This is not guaranteed for all mammoth species, because soft tissues were rarely found. But what is established is that they had much bigger tusks and a different body shape, with humps on their backs and a different forehead. There were also internal differences. Mammoths are generally pictured with a thick furry coat and long hairs because of a single particular species, the woolly mammoth, which appeared 400,000 years ago. It was a late species and is rather well known thanks to the discovery of well-preserved specimens in Siberia and North America, which were the areas where it lived. Woolly mammoths were about the size of an African elephant, so pretty big, and they were adapted to life in the cold steppes and tundras, where they fed on grass and ferns. Woolly mammoths were probably the last species of mammoths to go extinct, only 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. The main reason for their extinction is a bit uncertain. They were hunted by prehistoric men, and this probably at least contributed to their decline. But they also suffered a big reduction of their habitat, starting 40,000 years ago, in 
a new glaciation. They were adapted to life in cold regions, but not icy regions. They needed to ingest large quantities of grass, and this grass had to be able to grow. So the advance of glaciers and uh, permafrost at the surface was bad for them. In any case, mammoth hunting was certainly a factor, too. Woolly mammoths lived in herds. They could reach 60 years, and they did not reproduce very fast, a bit like elephants today. So their population could quickly decline and even disappear in a region if they were hunted intensively. For prehistoric men, they were a source of meat, of fur, of bones to make tools, and one mammoth could probably feed a group for weeks, so they were very attractive prey. A relative of the mammoth that lived in North America was the mastodon, which could be mistaken for a mammoth. A common species of mammoth in North America was the Colombian mammoth, which lived from the northern United States to Central America. And north of its territories, in Arctic regions of Canada, lived woolly mammoths. The Colombian mammoth disappeared 11 to 12,000 years ago. And here again, hunting is suspected to have contributed to it, because for about a thousand years, these mammoths coexisted with men in North America. But mastodons were not mammoths, nor elephants. They were distant cousins. They all diverged from a common ancestor around 27 million years ago. And from there, mastodons evolved separately, but they still resembled modern elephants a lot. It is believed that they lived in herds and were forest-dwelling animals. An argument in favor of this is that they had very different teeth from elephants and mammoths. Theirs were cusp-shaped and seemed well-suited for chewing leaves and branches of trees and shrubs. We don't know whether they were very hairy or not. They are often depicted with a thick coat of hair, like woolly mammoths, but some remains were found in Florida or central Mexico, and these were times during the Pleistocene when these regions were colder than today, but they were not freezing cold. So it looks unlikely that mastodons living there would have had so much hair. Like the Colombian mammoth, the mastodon went extinct at the end of the Ice Age, possibly due to a combination of climate change and hunting. The line has actually been drawn between the Pleistocene and our epoch, the Holocene, because of the extinction about at the same time, of many species of the megafauna, these large herbivorous mammals, like mammoths and mastodons. But there were other giant terrestrial mammals that disappeared at the same time. Another genus belonging to this megafauna was the Deprotodon, and this one takes us to Australia. The protodon is the largest marsupial that ever existed. A marsupial, that is to say, a member of a subclass of mammals that includes opossums, kangaroos, koalas, and others. Their distinctive characteristic is that the young are carried in a pouch. Due to geography and the seas that prevented species from going everywhere, Marsupials are endemic to Australia, some Indonesian islands, and the Americas. They have sometimes been introduced, relatively recently, to other regions, like in New Zealand in the 19th century, 
but this was due to human intervention. So, in the particular ecosystems of Australia that were separated from the rest of the world, marsupials thrived during the Ice Age, and their biggest representant was the protodon. The largest specimens found were estimated to be almost three tons heavy, and they could have stood six, seven feet tall. From 1.6 million to 44,000 years ago, they were the biggest mammals in Australia. And superficially, they could have looked like giant wombats. It is believed the protodons lived in open forests and savannas, feeding on leaves, grass and roots, possibly with a social organization that is often observed among mammals of big size. For example, with elephants, females and the young form families, whereas males leave these groups when they become adults to live alone and they regularly fight for the right to mate with not one, but all the females of the same group. The genus the Protodon went extinct about at the time when humans arrived. So here again there is no proof of this, but it is suspected that they could have fallen prey to hunting. They were herbivorous and maybe peaceful animals that could have been tempting prey for prehistoric men. Another well-known big mammal from the Ice Age is the Smelodon, better known as the saber-toothed cat or saber-toothed tiger. It seems, based on fossil records, that it appeared in North America. But thanks to the land bridge with South America, it also spread to the south. The biggest specimens, because Smelodon is a genus with different species, were found in South America, where they could have reached 500 to 1,000 pounds. That's 220 to 440 kilograms. Smelodons looked like big modern tigers, even though we ignore the color of their coat. But the most visible difference with tigers was overdeveloped canine teeth that gave them their nickname. Their jaws had a bigger gape than any modern cat, but their canines were probably rather fragile and adapted to precision killing. It must have been a formidable predator, and it is believed that it hunted bisons and camels that lived in the forests or mountains of North America forests and bush rather than plains, because it seems its characteristics called for ambush hunting. But this is just a guess, and we also ignore if smelodons lived in groups or alone. Like all the animals we talked about before, the genus did not survive the end of the Pleistocene. 12,000 years ago. It was probably not hunted by men, but the large prey it fed on could have disappeared, and competition with other species like wolves could have been a cause, as well as climate change. Almost all around the world, the rise of wolves during the Ice Age was a formidable competition for other predators. Individually, wolves were not as strong as smelodons or bears, but their numbers and their social organization, their collaboration and their adaptability, all of this made them very efficient predators, and certainly the main rivals of men to dominate the continents. Alongside wolves, which I told you about in another story about dogs and wolves. I'll put the link in the description. 
Another major change of the Ice Age was the rise of the genus Homo, of which our species, Homo sapiens, is the last remaining species. Now the family tree of modern humans is not stabilized at all, and is still subject to uh, revisions, because in the past few decades there were plenty of discoveries that revealed many more branches, many more subspecies than previously thought. Some are well documented by bones and other remains, Others are more speculative, and the timeline and the geography of the uh, expansion of the various species of Homo out of Africa is also uncertain. So I'll focus on what is fairly consensual, because it is backed by plenty of evidence. But still, bear in mind that these are theories and they are subject to uh, possible changes in the future. In the late 19th century emerged the theory that men descended from apes, that they were just a species subject to evolution like any other. And at the beginning this was a uh, very controversial idea. It was uh, very scandalous because it went against many uh, religious teachings and also uh, a very human-centric vision. But an evolution from apes to men looked very radical and little credible after all, because of the difference in appearance, skeleton and cognitive abilities between known apes like chimpanzees and human beings. This was too much. So, another hypothesis was formulated, the hypothesis of a missing link, an undiscovered or extinct species that would have been an intermediate stage of evolution. Modern scholars have let all of this behind, and with the help of many more discoveries of human remains, DNA, and uh, other means of investigation like carbon-14, the current position is not that men descended from apes, but they are related by a common ancestor, part of the same family. If we go up in the evolutionary tree, they are all parts of a branch called hominidae, a family of primates. Millions of years ago, Hominidae branched out into subfamilies. One is Pongini, also known as Asian hominids, because the last existing genus of this subfamily is orangutans and they live in Southeast Asia. But the representants of Pongini used to be present in various parts of Eurasia during the Pleistocene. Another subfamily of hominidae is hominini with an N instead of a D. And this subfamily, hominini, also split between various branches, gorillini, including gorillas, pan, which includes apes like chimpanzees and bonobos, and homo, our genus that makes Homo a cousin branch to apes, not its descendant. A question that remains open at this point is what was and when lived their last common ancestor. The divergence could have happened as early as 13 million years ago, long before the Ice Age. But hybridization, the possibility to reproduce between species, may have been going on for a very long time, possibly as recently as 4 million years ago. In any case, when the Pleistocene began, two and a half million years ago, the divergence had taken place between the genus Pan, apes, and another genus called Australopithecus. You certainly heard of Lucy, the name given to the remains of 
an individual discovered in Ethiopia. Lucy has been dated to about 3.2 million years ago. She was a female representant of a species of Australopithecus called Australopithecus afarensis. It is within Australopithecus that the genus Homo, ours, would have emerged. But the exact species of Australopithecus is unknown. There are several that are possible candidates to being our ancestor. So Lucy may or may not be our ancestor. But even if she wasn't, she was at least close to our ancestor. Another uncertainty is the precise delineation of Homo and Australopithecus. It has become more contentious in the past few years. Historically, the advent of Homo was fixed with the first use of stone tools. And it was thought to have happened around two to two and a half million years ago, in the early Ice Age. This was the consensus in the 1980s, for example. But more recent discoveries suggest that some species of Australopithecus may have used stone tools more than three million years ago. And this blurs the distinction between Australopithecus and Homo. Another thing that is being challenged is the succession of different species of Homo leading to our species, Homo sapiens, with two main links. Homo habilis, known to have used tools, followed by Homo erectus. Thirty years ago, the mainstream theory was that Homo habilis was the first representant, the first species of the genus Homo, that Homo erectus had evolved from Homo habilis, and that Homo sapiens had evolved from Homo erectus. But since then, evidence has surfaced that Homo habilis and Homo erectus had coexisted for a very long time, that Homo erectus did not necessarily descend from Homo habilis, and also that multiple species had appeared and gone extinct between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, like Homo antecessor, Homo florensiensis, the Java man, the Peking man. All of this has turned the family tree of the Homo genus into a bit of a mess right now. All these discoveries are stimulating and they reveal a profusion of species, but they also leave us with many question marks. A lot of disputes are currently unresolved in the field of paleoanthropology. But let's leave it aside and take a look at established species of archaic humans and what we know of them. So I'll tell you about Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, and finally us, Homo sapiens. Homo habilis appeared and lived in South and East Africa, a region that is considered the cradle of humanity, because this is where multiple species of Australopithecus and Homo appeared. Until the 1980s, Homo habilis was considered human because of his use of stone tools. But as I said before, this delineation is now contested and some experts would put the species into Australopithecus. It is still fine to call them archaic humans in any case, because they certainly exhibit characteristics in which we can recognize signs of humanity. They used tools, mainly for butchering, and it is believed that they form societies of a few dozen individuals. Much has been speculated about the organization of their societies, the distribution of roles between males and females. But the truth is that there is not enough evidence to conclude. 
what we know better is their appearance. They were relatively small, around 3 to 5 feet depending on individuals. Males were taller. They were also relatively frail compared with us. They would have weighed 45 to 80 pounds, that's 20 to 36 kilograms. They consumed meat, which probably made a big part of their diet. And it is believed that a large part of this meat came from scavenging rather than hunting. They also ate fruit. We know it because the measured dental erosion on specimens is consistent with regular exposure to acidity. They could have spent time in trees. This is deducted from their proportions. They had long arms relatively to the size of their body and hand bones that could have permitted precision gripping. Homo habilis could probably stand upright for some time and run, but that was certainly not his uh, usual posture. Based on his anatomy, so it is speculated that they alternated standing upright and moving on four limbs. Trees could have been a good environment for them, for safety first, because they were threatened by predators. There is no evidence to suggest that Homo habilis used fire in any sort of controlled way, but there could exist signs of an early form of architecture, because in 1962, a circle of stones dated to 1.7 million years ago was discovered in Africa. At regular intervals, rocks were piled up to 6-9 inches high, that's 15 to 23 centimeters, and these rock piles could have been used to support poles stuck into the ground, maybe to support a rough hut or windbreak or maybe another use, but the structure is artificial. And as such, it is the oldest claimed evidence of architecture in the world. But a big question mark is whether Homo habilis built it, or another species. Because Homo habilis coexisted with others. There were Homo erectus, that we are going to talk about in a moment, Homo ergaster, an African subspecies that could have been part of Homo erectus, this is unresolved, Homo rudolfensis, also a speculative species, it has been argued that they could be male specimens of Homo habilis because they were bigger, or representants of Paranthropus, a late species of Australopithecus. At the time of Homo habilis, at least at the beginning, it seems Africa was the only continent where the genus lived. This changed with Homo erectus, literally upright man. Homo erectus appeared about two million years ago, not that long after Homo habilis. And there is no doubt that this species went out of Africa. Plenty of remains have been found in Asia and in Europe. It is unsure whether it evolved from Homo habilis or if they had a common Australopithecus ancestor. But what we know is that these archaic men resembled us much more. They had a flat face, a prominent nose, and possibly spares body hair. And Homo erectus was the first known human to become an apex predator. Of course, individuals could fall prey to other predators, but overall, they were at the top of the food chain where they lived, and they hunted actively. Homo erectus was able to hunt in groups it cared for injured or sick group members, a characteristic that has not been proven among older species, and it used fire. 
individuals were taller than Homo habilis, with a size of 4 feet 9 inches to 6 feet, that's 146 to 185 centimeters, rather close to Homo sapiens. And they weighed 88 to 150 pounds, that's 40 to 68 kilograms. It is unclear whether they were capable of speech. We only have bones to study. But it is postulated that they could communicate with a basic proto-language made of modulated sounds. The region where Homo erectus first appeared is uh, unknown. It has been found in Africa, in Europe and Asia. The earliest remains were found in South Africa and a few thousand years later in China. So there are various theories. One is that Homo erectus evolved in Africa and expanded from there. Another is that it appeared in West Asia and in the Middle East before going in every direction from there to East Asia back to Africa, and even to Spain, to the West. In any case, different subspecies have been found that illustrate the radiation and the success of Homo erectus. Names that you may have heard of, like Java Man, Homo Georgicus, Peking Man, Totavel Man, these are generally considered part of the Homo erectus species, like subspecies. But there is an ongoing debate about whether Homo erectus was a wide-ranging polymorphous species, which would simplify things a lot, or whether all these subspecies, or some of them, should be considered independently, but still they collectively were the dominant representants of Homo for almost two million years. Because the extinction of Homo erectus is dated to 100,000 to 110,000 years ago. This early example of architecture I mentioned before, the stone circle found in Africa, could also well be the work of Homo erectus. It sounds actually more likely than Homo habilis, given what we know of Homo erectus' cognitive abilities. There are, in any case, other sites with construction in various parts of Europe, Africa and Asia that confirm that Homo erectus could build, and that this species also developed the use of cave habitation. About 600,000 years ago, Evidence of cave use multiplies, which indicates plenty of Homo erectus groups adopted them. Homo erectus gave way to a new species called Homo heidelbergensis, which for a long time was subsumed as a subspecies of Homo erectus, but it is increasingly considered as its own species that would have evolved from an African form of Homo erectus. Because there is strong evidence that Homo heidelbergensis is the common ancestor to two new species, Neanderthal, Homo neanderthalis, and us, Homo sapiens. Homo heidelbergensis is characterized by more complex tools and the use of fire in everyday life. For example, the appearance of hefting technology, that is to say, attaching an artifact made of stone, in that case, to a haft, to make, for example, a spear or an axe. This is contemporary to the emergence of Homo heidelbergensis, and uh, signs of his presence have been observed in Africa and in Europe. At a time that is still disputed, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens would have evolved from Homo heidelbergensis. First appeared Neanderthal, 
maybe as early as 800,000 years ago, but the oldest remains have been dated to 400-300,000 years ago. Neanderthal appeared and lived in Eurasia, based on known remains, and lasted until about 40,000 years ago. There is an ongoing debate here again about why they went extinct and uh, if they actually uh, disappeared alone because they had a relatively small population and they could have been bred into extinction assimilated by Homo sapiens. In any case, modern humans still carry Neanderthal's genome in various proportions depending on their regions of origin. Bear in mind that in these waves of archaic human migration out of Africa and maybe back to it, various species coexisted at the same time and could have reproduced between them. There were waves, but also a lot of mixing. Now in popular culture, the image of the an evolved caveman archetype remains attached to Neanderthals. But when they appeared, they were the most evolved human species in terms of cognitive abilities, and probably not very different from Homo sapiens on many counts. Their technology was sophisticated, way more than Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis. To give you examples, they could create fire, not only keep it burning, they built homes in caves, they made simple clothes similar to blankets or ponchos, they could also weave, they had different cooking techniques, including roasting, boiling or smoking, they knew some medicinal plants, they went seafaring on the Mediterranean Sea, and maybe another evolution that makes them close to us is the possible development of symbolic thought among them. This is still very controversial because it is unsure they can be attributed to them, but a number of discoveries hint that maybe they made ornaments with feathers or shells, possibly music, what could be an ancient flute was discovered or they could have collected unusual objects like crystals or fossils. This remains unsure, but in any case their brain size was in the range of modern humans, and their anatomy had only limited differences with us, like a more elongated skull. For reasons that are not precisely known, they never formed a large population only small groups, and this could be a reason for their absorption by Homo sapiens. Because while Neanderthal men were spreading to Europe and Asia, a new species was appearing in Africa, Homo sapiens. As a species, Neanderthals probably evolved somewhere between Europe and Asia. And as we have seen before, Homo erectus could have appeared out of Africa. But modern humans appeared in East Africa, near the cradle of Australopithecus and many iterations of hominides. This would have happened around 300,000 years ago, later than Neanderthal, but since their ancestors were the same, the two species were genetically compatible to reproduce. Of course, you know what Homo sapiens looks like, this is what we all are. But what distinguished Homo sapiens from archaic humans was its cognitive and social abilities, not just technical, but also behavioral. At a time estimated to be 160 to 170,000 years ago, Homo sapiens began to exhibit what paleoanthropologists called behavioral modernity. 
This is a term created to name a series of traits that distinguish Homo sapiens from other more ancient humans. Abstract thinking, the ability to plan on long periods of time, also a symbolic behavior, traits like the production of ornamentation and art, the expression through music and dance that are not directly necessary to survival, and also more technological breakthroughs like the use of blades, for example. The first generations of Homo sapiens lived in East Africa, and from there they spread with such success that they ended occupying all continents and major islands of the world. They spread in several waves, replacing or absorbing all other human groups in the process. First to South Africa, then West Africa, the Middle East, Asia. 65,000 years ago they were in India, and shortly after in Australia, Europe and China, before crossing to America by the north, and then all the way south to South America. By the end of the Ice Age, some 12,000 years ago, men had taken possession of Earth. The last glaciation was ending, and soon prehistory would end. Countless inventions would follow. At some point, thousands of years later, metals would replace stone, ending the Stone Age. Human societies would elaborate complex systems of thought. They would build, fight, create, and exploit the planet for the better or the worse. The time for the beginning of history was nearing. But this is another story, and for now, we have reached the end of our journey. You can now fall asleep or pick another story from my library if you want to explore other aspects of human history. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.